This morning's scripture lesson. <clears throat> pardon. Me. This morning's scripture lesson is John 6, 26 through 35. <coughs> Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about the perishable things like food. <coughs> Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give to you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, We want to perform God's work too. What should we do? Jesus told them, This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he sent, has sent. They answered, Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scripture says Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses did not give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Alan. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 6 as we move into week number 3 of our current sermon series that I've entitled True or False, Finding the Good News in John's Gospel. Uh, for those of you who have been here, we have been moving through the Gospel of John and we've uh, presented this in such a way that really what John is doing as he moves through this story of the life and ministry of Jesus is to present a set of truths and falsehoods. What John is addressing is that there are certain things, certain beliefs about God that are not true, that we tend to believe. And so John comes through and says, because of Jesus, this is what we know the truth to be. And so you can see where we've been so far in July and as we move into August, and this will continue uh, through the first part of September. And we're answering some very important questions that people tend to have and some misconceptions that they tend to have about the faith. Last week we answered an extremely important question that many people aren't too sure about, which is how do I get to heaven? And we talked about these three changes that are required of everybody who wants to spend eternity with God. Our one sentence sermon last week was that eternal life cannot be earned, as many believe, but instead it requires a spiritual rebirth. And we looked at these three changes that are required in order to have that spiritual rebirth. Uh, we have to have a change of mind, we have to have a change of life, and finally we have to have a change of identity. And so this week we want to answer the question, how do we find God's love? How do we get God's love? How can we be sure that God loves us? Uh, I was reading an interesting study this last week as I started thinking about getting ready for school to start again. And uh, it's research that they've done about this new phenomenon that they're starting to identify called AOC or ACOs or Adult Ch Children of Overindulgence. Uh, most of you sitting out here this morning would not qualify as that. You grew up uh, just getting what you got and liking what you got and being thankful for what you got. But people my age and younger, and a lot of the people that will be coming into my classroom here in just a few weeks, are what we would classify as adult or young adult children of overindulgence. Uh, these are people who a lot of times have grown up in a broken home uh, with either uh, a divorce that's happened or a single parent just from the beginning who feels very guilty. They feel like, um, I've given my child a bad start in life and it's all my fault and so as a result of that I'm going to buy my child everything I possibly can. I'm going to give them everything they ask for. I'm going to anticipate their needs. I'm going to give, 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 give. And it tends to have the opposite of its intended effect because what any good parent wants is for their child to feel loved and feel cared for and feel secure. But what overindulging a child actually accomplishes is it sends a message to a child that says, Love is something I can hold in my hands. 
Love is something that I get from another person in exchange for something else. Love is something that I'm really excited about initially, but then it kind of fades away. I need something else. And so researchers are starting to see this phenomenon. See if you know anybody who fits any of these descriptors. Uh, people who tend to be classified as an ACO would answer yes to the question or the statement, uh, I have extreme difficulty making decisions. We tend to see people with this phenomenon uh, who just can't ever make up their mind. They're bouncing back and forth from one thing to another. I need praise and material <laughs> reward. In other words, it's always a question of what's in it for me. If I do this, what will you give me? Uh, I don't have to grow up because people will take care of me. Uh, we have an entire generation of people who have delayed their entrance into the adult world, this extended adolescence that we talk about in the world of psychology. We used to say that adolescence uh, ended and we became adults at age 18. Now the average person, we say they're more like 28, maybe close to 30 before they stop being an adolescent. Uh, I feel like I need lots of things in order to feel good about myself. And so we have this phenomenon of overspending, of compulsive buying. Uh, I am unlovable. If you don't believe this to be true, just sit down with a person age of about 35 or younger and talk to them for a few minutes and you get the sense very quickly that they don't feel loved and they really, really seriously fear that they will never be loved. I have to have gifts or I have to buy gifts in order to be loved. I have to buy other people's love. I constantly need outside affirmation from my friends. Spend 10 seconds on social media and you see this one to be very true. So uh, David Bredehoff, who is the one who's heading up this research, uh, says this about it. He says, ACOs tend to have more issues with overeating, overspending, child rearing, interpersonal boundaries, and decision making because they have a skewed sense of love, how to get love, how to give love, how to keep love. They have trouble giving to themselves, giving to others, and functioning in the adult world. So we're going to talk about this idea this morning. What is John telling us about how to be loved, how to know that you are loved by God beyond a shadow of a doubt? Our foundational thought for this morning is that there is no way to experience the love of God other than to accept it humbly and gratefully on His terms. We can't buy it, we can't earn it, we can't get it from other people. It has to be accepted from God. I love the way C.S. Lewis describes that. Listen to his words. The Christian does not think that God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because He loves us. Just as the roof of a sun house does not attract the sun because it is bright, but it becomes bright because the sun shines on it. This is the good news that John shares with us this morning. Because the light of the love of God shines upon us, we have the opportunity to light up and to not only receive that love, but to pass it along to other people that God puts in our paths. Our lie that we're going to be contesting this morning is that God only loves me when I'm doing well, doesn't love me when I am not. In our one sentence sermon for this morning, the truth that we'll be looking at is that God's love is unconditional. That's good news for me. That's good news for you. That's good news for all of us. And it is not based on spiritual activity. Three bad substitutes that we'll look at this morning that John lays out for us that we tend to confuse with uh, accepting God's love. Number one, we're going to see that many people just think, if I just have all the answers, then God will love me. Secondly, we see that people many times assume that if I just work hard enough, God will love me. And then finally, we'll see that many people also mistakenly assume that the only way I can know that God loves me is to continually have these emotional responses that confirm that truth in my life. So we begin with this idea of having all of the answers. How many of you, well, let me read the scripture first here. So uh, John tells us that uh, Jesus' response to the crowds of people following him is this. And it sounds kind of harsh initially. He says, you want to be with me because I fed you, because I gave you things, not because you understood the miraculous signs that I was doing. How many of you ever, have ever heard of the idea of a eureka moment? Anybody? Anybody at all? That moment where that light bulb kind of goes on over your head. If you remember watching cartoons back in the old days, when somebody would have an idea, that ping, that light bulb would go on over their head, and they would have this brilliant idea. Wiley Coyote would run off and make an order to Acme products, and he would get some kind of thing back he was going to use to finally get the Roadrunner or whatever the case was. Uh, they've actually done some studies of this, and they've determined that 
people have a hard time coming up with answers to questions for a particular reason. And they illustrated it by doing a series of problems like this. So I want you to uh, think about what is the explanation to this statement. The statement is this. Thankfully, there was a haystack because the cloth ripped. Thankfully, there was a haystack because the cloth ripped. Did anybody just immediately figure out what's going on in that particular scenario? Most of the people that they did this research with were just as baffled by that as you were. They sat there and thought, that doesn't make any sense. There was a haystack. Thankfully, there was a haystack because the cloth ripped. And so then what they would do is they would give them a prompt or a primer statement to help them get the solution. So what if I just gave you one word and I said the word parachute? Suddenly, does it make sense? Thankfully, there was a haystack because the cloth ripped in the context of a parachute. Immediately, I saw light bulbs going on all across the congregation. Yeah, okay, now that makes sense. Sometimes we need a prompting. Sometimes we need a little bit of help to understand things. Stellan Olson, who led up this, uh, this particular research, uh, observed this. He said, the first step of problem solving is that we consider things in the light of our previous experience. We try to fit it into an existing schema or a box that we already have. But that doesn't always work. And so eventually we reach an impasse. We reach this place where all approaches to the problem have failed and the person becomes frustrated. We don't have an existing box to put this problem into. And so we just go, well, I guess I'm just never going to get it. I don't know why, thankfully, there was a haystack there. It's the same thing with God. We try to understand God on our terms. We try to have the answers. We try to put God into a box. And when it doesn't happen, Sadly, many people give up. And so Jesus' assurance to the crowds, the multitudes, is it's okay. You don't have to understand. The word he uses here, understood, is a Greek term. It's ido, and it means to fully grasp a spiritual truth. And I don't know about you, but I've studied the Bible for a long time. I've preached for a number of years. I've taught for more years than that. And there are some things I still don't understand. People say, why does God do this? Why does this happen? And I'm like, I don't know. That's something I would like to ask God about someday when I see him face to face. Uh, Jesus talks about this problem as well in Matthew using this same word. He tells people, you have to keep watch for you don't know, you don't I know, you don't fully grasp the day or the hour of my return. And the word here would have elicited this response of the people who were listening. They would have understood when somebody is tasked with keeping watch, whether it's at the city gates or uh, shepherds out in the fields, they were responsible for keeping a light going. You had to keep a, a certain area illuminated so that if a problem came along, if something happened, they would know what to do. And so Jesus is saying, you're not going to get it right away. It's going to take time. It's going to be a process. But keep the light on so that when the time comes, you will understand. You see, we will never have all the answers where God is concerned. This side of eternity. There's a day that we're promised that we will know as we are known, but that's not today, so we shouldn't expect that of ourselves. Uh, Albert Barnes, in talking about this term, I know, comments this. He says, the word carries the idea of having the know-how, the knowledge, or the skill necessary to accomplish a desired goal. But here's the paradox, is that human beings simply cannot know divine truth intuitively. The only way they can is if they become members of God's family. And so Jesus is flipping the script on these people. He's saying, you don't have to know the secret password to become a part of the family of God, to receive God's love. But instead, as you receive God's love, you'll gain that knowledge. You see, we grow in our knowledge and our appreciation of who God is as we continue to walk in relationship with His Son. Our first key point is that we begin to find the love of God when we accept that we're only going to understand as much as is necessary to continue to live in obedience. It's holding that light out. It's taking the next step as it is illuminated rather than seeing the whole path live up in front of us. And I don't know about you, but I don't like that very much. I like to have a plan. I like to have everything laid out. But my experience in life is that God says, I'm not doing anything else until you take the next step. And it requires faith each and every time. This is what the prophet is talking about when God is speaking to the people of Israel. And God says, just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You're not going to get it. Take what I give you. Take the light that is given to you. Rick Warren puts it this way. He says, 
You were made by God and for God. And until you understand that, life will never make sense. Stop trying to have all the answers. Stop waiting for everything to make sense. And walk forward in the next step of faith that God gives you. The second error that we make is that we try to work too hard. Uh, the people respond to Jesus and they say, Great, so uh, we don't have to understand everything. But here's what we'd like to do. We want to do the cool stuff that you do because that'll show that we're in with you. So we want to know how to change water into wine. We want to know how to make the crippled be able to walk. Uh, we want to know how to take five loaves and two fishes and feed 5,000 people. We want to perform God's works too. How do we do that? And so Jesus has to teach them that working hard is also not the solution. Uh, there are two different kinds of students that walk into my classroom each and every semester and I can pretty much pick out which one they're going to be very quickly. Research shows that we have two different types of learners. We have performance-oriented learners and we have learning-oriented learners. And you would much prefer, as you can probably intuit by the names, you would much prefer to have a learning-oriented learner. Uh, performance-oriented learners tend to come into class on the first day. Uh, they're the ones that are sitting on the front row and they've got everything out in front of them. And they have very specific questions. There are questions like, how many pages does my term paper have to be? How many points do I have to have to get an A? Um, what's your policy on absences? What's the absolute maximum number of absences I can have? And uh, they want a list, they want a contract that says, if I do this bare minimum, then you will give me an A. Uh, these are the students that the first time grades come out, and I have a lot of first semester freshmen, and it's their first college experience, and they come in and uh, they get my whole list of stuff, and then they don't follow it. They just go through and they do what they're going to do, and they get their first B, or even worse, their first C of their lifetime, and they come to my office in tears. Dr. Bills, I don't understand what happened. I did it. It was supposed to be four pages, and it was kind of four pages, and, and I kind of did what you said, and so I have to go through very calmly and say, it's okay. This happens to everybody. Here's what you needed to do to change them into a learning oriented learner. If you would have made it four pages instead of two and a half and tried to disguise that two and a half and make it look like four by doing 16 point font and triple spacing everything and making weird margins so it looks like a newspaper article rather than actual paper, you probably would have gotten a higher grade. Very few students, the ones that I love to see in my class are the older students. They are non-traditional students. They have gone out and they've worked and a light bulb went on in their head at one point, and they said, you know what, I'm gonna go back to school. And so they come in, and instead of being 18, they're 28, they're 38, sometimes they're older than that, but they are in class for a different reason. They're in class because they're like, I always wanted to learn about psychology, and so I'm kind of seeing what this is about. And you can see their eyes light up when I talk about things, and they're taking notes, and they're going, oh, now I understand this, and I understand that, and they're, they're absorbing it, they're eating it up. Do they care about their grades? Yeah, a little bit, but much more than that, they're concerned with how can this make my life better? How can it make the lives of people around me better? And so here's what Gentry, J.W. Gentry, who studied this performance versus learner orientation discovered. He said, those with a learning orientation, the important difference is that they react very favorably to negative outcomes. In other words, when things go wrong, they get their first grade back and it's not what they wanted. They approach and they don't panic. They don't say, uh oh, college is not for me, or I hate you, you're a horrible teacher, you just don't like me. Instead, they go, okay, help me understand. What can I do better next time? By contrast, those with performance orientations will not. They're the ones who give up. And so Jesus is saying, this is hard. It's hard to follow me. It's hard to accept my love. It's hard to walk in the light that I'm providing. And so if you're going to take a performance orientation, you're going to get discouraged. You're going to give up. This word perform here, the gatsomai in the Greek means to accomplish. But it also means something interesting here. It means to acquire by means of labor or to make a trade. I don't, I'm sure none of you have ever done this, but another group of students that I always see uh, every semester are the ones who they figured out, I've always gotten through school based on my charm. I'm not going to do the reading. I may or may not turn on my assignments, but I'm going to make sure Dr. Mills really likes me. So they're the ones that sit up front and they laugh at all my jokes harder than everybody else and they, they stick around after class and ask me questions and they always just want to come up and say hi and uh, you know, touch me on the arm and let me know that they're there. Uh, and 
they're sorely disappointed when that doesn't work. They're trying to perform, they're trying to earn their grade by not doing what I've asked them to do. Uh, this word is used in Romans, Paul talks about it. And he says the reason why we prefer this earning orientation, this performance orientation, is because it makes us feel better about ourselves. We can say, I got this amazing free gift from God and I earned it my way. I own this. This is mine. And so he says, when people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they've earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their, their gotsomai, their means of labor, this trade that they've made with God, but instead because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. In other words, God says, I've thrown out the grading scale, I've thrown out the curve, I've thrown out the list of assignments. You have to just accept it because I say I'm giving it to you. You see, we will never be able to work hard enough or long enough to deserve God's love. It will never happen. You can be smart, you can be funny, you can be good looking, you can give away millions of dollars, but you will not earn God's love. The door to his love is open when we just accept it as a free gift that's paid for by Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Charles Haddon Spurgeon puts it this way, Now every believer may plead at this day the ancient deeds of the Lord, the work of Calvary, the overthrow of death and sin and hell. He who wrought out our salvation of old will not, cannot, desert us now. We can't work hard enough. We have to just accept the gift. Our second key point is that we exist in the love of God as we've learned to check our egos, Stop trying to be able to say, I deserve this, and instead learn to come daily before the throne, humbly confessing, God, I bring nothing of worth to you aside from Christ's sacrifice on my behalf. I'm not good enough, but Christ is. Thank you for that wonderful gift. This is what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 2 when he says, It is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Nobody can get a big head. I love the way Martin Luther puts this. He says, our good works do not generate righteousness, but rather our righteousness in Christ generates good works. People who do good things for the right reasons give off a glow. They make other people around them excited. They make other people around them better, not because of what they're doing, but because they're allowing that free gift of God, the Spirit of Christ, to work through them touch other people. So we're not going to understand. We're not going to get it by working hard. And finally, we're not going to get it through an emotional response. So the people say, okay, we're not going to understand it. Now you're telling us we can't do cool magic tricks in order to know that we're in with you. Can you at least show us some miraculous signs? Can you do some more of the cool stuff? Make things disappear. Change people's lives. Whatever it is uh, so that we feel like you are telling us the truth. Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. How many of you have ever, have ever heard of the term red herring before? Anybody? Yeah, red herring is kind of a rhetorical device that we use to distract people from what's really going on. Uh, you know, so you'll see this, uh, you see this with your teenagers. You tell them you need to be home by 11.30, they come home at 12.45 and you say you're grounded. And they say, it's not fair. You're the worst parent in the world. All the other kids get to stay out as late as they want. You're ruining my life. That's a red herring because they're trying to make you feel bad by throwing this out here and saying, look at how horrible my life is and it's all your fault and you should feel bad for me and not focus on the fact that I didn't follow the rules. This term actually came from back in the 16 and 1700s when they would be training hounds to follow foxes on a fox hunt. Uh, they would uh, give the hounds the scent of the fox and then they would release the fox and they would go out and they would be chasing it. And in order to train the hounds not to be distracted, they would get uh, what they called kippered or pickled herrings. They were these little red fish, and they would, through the pickling process, the smell would be really pungent, and it would be especially pungent for a dog. And so then they would, they would go along the side of the trail, and they would wave these red herrings, and the scent would go out, and uh, dogs initially would be distracted. They would be like, oh, what's that smell? And they would go towards the stronger smell rather than the smell of the fox. And so Nicholas Cox, a historian in talking about this, says the herring wasn't used to distract the hounds or horses from the trail, but rather it was used to guide them along it. The idea was that it teaches you to differentiate from what you're supposed to be focusing on and what seems to be demanding my attention. And as I learn to focus on what I'm supposed to be focusing on, I can be assured that I'm on the right.
betrayal. And so Jesus' response to the crowds is, the miracles and the signs in many ways are just a red herring. Miraculous signs in the Greek, semion, means actions that authenticate God's eternal purposes, but the other aspect of it that these people were focusing on is something that's contrary to the course of nature, something that makes us just go, wow, that was so cool, and it makes that chill go down your spine, and it makes your face flush, and it, it just makes you feel like the world is an interesting place, and yet Jesus' response is that only an evil and adulterous generation would demand a simeon, a miraculous sign. Well, why would Jesus say that? Why would Jesus be so hard on these people? I think it's because it tends to pull us off the trail. We tend to assume that I always need this, that if I don't have this every single moment of every single day, then God's abandoned me, or I'm not good enough, or I never was a Christian in the first place. Uh, most of you know that I grew up in a different faith tradition. I grew up a Southern Baptist, and one of the things we would do as Southern Baptists as I was growing up was people would stop showing up at church, things would get kind of lax, and so the pastors would get excited. They said, you know what we need is a revival. And I don't know what a revival is in Methodist sense, or Methodists even do revivals, but for Southern Baptists, that meant uh, having an entire week where you'd show up every night, and they would have a different speaker come in, and they would have different music, and they would spend this time just getting people whipped up into an emotional response with the music, and then they'd have people give testimonies. You know, before I knew Jesus, I drank all the time, and I couldn't keep a job, and now I haven't drunk in five years, and I make a million dollars a year, and I have a beautiful wife, and all these kids in this house, and everybody's going, yeah, that's great, that's what I want too. And then the speaker would get up, and they would give this very emotionally tinged sermon, uh, just kind of plant these seeds to make you doubt. Am I really saved? Do I really even know who God is? What do I do if I die tonight? Do I know that I would wake up in heaven? And so they would plant these little seeds, and then they would end it, and they would say, you know, this is the point for you to make a decision for Christ. And we're going to sing, and you come down the aisle and give your life to Christ. And then we would sing 66 verses of Just As I Am, and during that whole time, you're just, oh, maybe I don't know God. I don't feel different in my heart. I don't have this weird feeling, and I kind of have a funny feeling in the pit of my stomach. But somewhere along verse 58, come down front and you would give your life to Christ again for the 15th or 20th time. And so everybody would be on a real spiritual, emotional high for a couple of weeks and everybody's at church and everybody's happy and treating each other well, but then it fades and life goes back to where it was before. Here's what I want you to think about is that we will never come to truly know and experience God's love if we look for it only in miracles and in highly emotional things are rare, they're short-lived, they're intense, but most importantly, they're not going to carry us through life. They're not going to apply to real life. Uh, the great Quaker scholar William Barclay puts it this way. He says, in any mir miracle, there are three things. There's the wonder, which leaves men dazzled, astonished, and aghast. That's what these people are looking for. There's the power, which can deal with and mend a broken body, an unhinged mind, a bruised heart which can do things. And we need those things sometimes. But here's the part that Jesus is trying to point out to these people and saying is the important part. And then there's the sign. And the sign is not supposed to elicit an emotional response. It's not supposed to make us feel guilty or euphoric. But it's supposed to point us to the love in the heart of the God who does such things for men. Jesus is saying you have to get to the point where the knowledge of that love has been internalized to the point where that's what sticks with you not the cruel and emotional things. Last key point, we grow in the love of God as we learn to accept that faith is never going to be an exemption from the ups and the downs and the challenges of life, but instead, faith is an offer of a companion to walk with us through them. God will walk with us. God won't always make the problems go away. God won't always protect us from disappointment, from pain, from bad things, but he will walk with us. He will help us to grow. He will help us to focus on him. In John chapter 20, uh, Christ has been resurrected and the disciples have gathered together and we know that Thomas says, I will not believe until I see the holes in his hands and I put my, hole, my uh, fingers in the hole in his side. And so Jesus says, here you go, Thomas. And Thomas does so and he says, I believe my Lord and my God. And Jesus scolds him and he says, you believe, Thomas, because you have seen me. But blessed are those who believe without seeing me, who don't need the miracles, who don't need the semion, who 
who know me well enough to follow me through their doubts and through their fears. Greg Laurie puts it this way. He says, God will test you because he wants you to be mature. God will let you be disappointed. God will let you dangle sometimes longer than you think is necessary because he wants you to mature. He wants you to develop a walk with him that is not based on your fluctuating emotions, but on your commitment to him as you learn to walk by faith. Three questions to ask yourself as we go into this next week. Number one, am I willing to follow Christ even if I never fully understand all of my why questions? I hate to disappoint you, but it's not going to happen. You've got to follow me. Anyway. Number two, will I choose to serve joyfully as an expression of gratitude rather than obligation? Will I shift out of that earning mindset and do it because I'm grateful for what God has freely given me? And thirdly, can I accept that my feelings are going to waver, but at the same time, my faith can continue to grow as I stay faithful, as I follow faithfully 